Hey, Paul, what, in your opinion, is the greatest LucasArts adventure game of all time? Uh, Wrong! It's Maniac Mansion! So now today we're going to be discussing why is Maniac Mansion your favorite LucasArts game of all time, Paul? Well, I'm just now learning that it's my favorite, but um, that should, should be pretty easy to run with. Um, because it kind of is, it, it, you know, it walks that line where it's like it's the first, it's the innovator. So it's like it kind of has rights to being the first, um, whereas the latter ones I love. But this is what started it all. And, and um I mean, let, let's face it, mate, without Maniac Mansion, we wouldn't have Thimbleweed Park. So, yeah, there we go. It's, <laughs> it's my favorite. I All got right. that out of the way. You got, you got that out of your system? One. Are we good? Are we good? Mm, yeah, I wouldn't say out of my system, but yeah, there's <laughs> at least one ticked off. All right. Well, let, let's um, let, let's focus on Maniac Mansion today because, uh, as you can tell, Maniac Mansion is my favorite LucasArts adventure game of all time. And correctly so, because if it's not yours, then you are wrong. Like, objectively. But I, it, it's one of those things where, you know, I, I don't, just as you fail to ever try to not mention Thimbleweed Park, I guess I kind of, I tend to favor Sierra over LucasArts, um, at least as far as companies. You know, LucasArts games are awesome. They're amazing. They're great. In a lot of ways, individually better than most of the Sierra catalog. But I've sort of always had that soft spot for Sierra over Lu- LucasArts. I, I completely, I completely agree. I mean, I, I do, f- I do favor Sierra, um, you know, but it, it is close. It's like 60, 40, 70, 30, yeah, something that's about like right. that. Um, but, you know, and I think uh, in your defense, you kind of balance it out because even though, you know, Sierra's kind of the, 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 company as you said that, that we talk about probably more than the than lucas Arts or any other your your kind of go-to game is loom so so it kind of balances out we can mm-hmm. talk a lot about sierra as long as you know we're both <laughs> going on about about loom and 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 thimbleweed which is sort of lucas not really but you know I, I think one of the things about maniac mansion that gets to me is that it kind of speaks to me as a sierra fan because it is that lucas arts game where you could screw up and you could die and you could hit unwinnable states. So it was basically the LucasArts take on a Sierra game. I'm pretty sure it wasn't actually, but in practice, it kind of was. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I know Ron Gilbert had said that, you know, his inspiration for, for me, Nick mentioned, came from watching a, a younger family member playing King's Quest and things like that. So, I mean, you know, King's Quest was the 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 poster child for adventure games early on, and, and so that's all they knew, and... He went on to, to write that article of, you know, why adventure games suck, uh, which is a great <laughs> article uh, coming from someone who loves adventure games. And more importantly, coming from Ron Gilbert, like godfather of adventure games. So it is a tongue in cheek title. But if you get time, go to his website. I think it's like grumpy gamer dot something. Um, I got you halfway there. You can Google it. Grumpy gamer. But he wrote an awesome article called um, why adventure games suck. And it's kind of his journey into how he took his lucas arts i was gonna say his company i guess that'd be george's but how he he, <laughs> he went from a maniac mansion to uh really friendly as far as not being able to die games like sam and max and, and loom and all them things um but it's a cool article regardless so uh how old were you when you played maniac mansion um you know i was probably 10 years old okay nine or ten something like that yeah i really got into games uh somewhere between eight and ten um and in order just top three or else this would be like a four hour just me talking rant and if i'm interrupted i will start over no um <laughs> there's a rain man twitch there sorry um uh, i played uh, police quest gold rush and then maniac mansion um oh, so it was all in that you know eight to ten years old range um how about you um, you know, it, it, funny, I, I think it was roughly around that time as well. But again, you got to factor in there's a bit of an age difference, not not a huge age difference, but there's like a handful of years between us. And uh, again, I think we came across it probably roughly around the same age in life, even though separated by a few years, because I'm pretty sure it came out. Um, I'm pretty sure I played it very close to when it came out. Uh, it was all over. I, I remember it being all over the magazines. It was always featured in everything. It was it was a huge deal, uh, Maniac Mansion, because it was just such a it was very innovative in a lot of ways. You know, I remember some of the uh, gaming magazines had like full maps and walkthroughs of it. 
they uh they released a tv series sort of um <laughs> a tv series that uh, <sighs> We're going to save that for another episode, but... Literally, if we can muscle through more than a few episodes, yeah. If I can uh, muscle through more than the first episode. I, I tried <laughs> watching it again, and I'll, I'll talk about this another time when we actually sit down to talk about the series, but it's clear that it's clear that they saw that this thing was like a big deal and used the name to leverage a show at all and then just decided to do whatever the hell they wanted with it. Right, they took the namesake and, and it kind of went a different direction, That's which is always really disappointing because your target audience is probably fans of the game, so if you're not staying on that subject, it's going to disappoint those who love the game and those who didn't even know about it. It's just a shit TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, even even Eugene Levy couldn't carry it, I guess. I didn't get all the way through the first episode. I think I stopped like about halfway through, and it's because I just couldn't take it. It was just un bearable i couldn't believe what i was watching but so it's weird it's sad to see that these like uh comedy geniuses just that that's what they came up with and there's and you know maniac mansion is like some good material if they actually wanted to you know play the game and try to base this on it yeah they should have like literally stuck to the script like just play out the game and you'll get some laughs as opposed Pretty to similar yeah because i mean you're talking like without commercials like 23 minute episode you couldn't get through it that's that's not a good sign mm-hmm. um but yeah so i mean it, it was great because you know there was the huge name at the time obviously uh maniac mansion was like did, did you say it was like the first lucas arts adventure game you know, I think or one of them. One of them, I think, uh, Labyrinth was the first adventure game from them, uh, based based off the movie. Mm. Um, but it's yeah, it's, it's really hard game to to find. You have to you know jump on eBay to get it. Um, you know, it wasn't put on GOG or Steam, in other words. Um, but yeah, I think I, I think Labyrinth was the first adventure game. But you know, it's almost like. Mm, what mystery house is to king's quest um def- definitely higher quality than Myst- mystery house which is just you know black screen white lines but but nonetheless you know kind of a let, let's just see how this goes sort of mm-hmm. thing and and then actually try um so, but for all intents and purposes uh, you know we could say it's it's basically the first adventure game the, the first right you know recognized one commercial hit all them things first one written with scum obviously yeah. the but, but obviously it came before things like um the monkey island or any of the Indiana Jones games. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I've, I've read that it was released in 1987, which was hard to believe. I thought it would be a little bit older than that, just because like Last Crusade was like 88 yeah. uh, or, or something, maybe 89. Um, but it, they must have just pumped them out from there. Um, I, think, uh, I think it was 89 or 90 when the movie came out. So I think the game came out probably maybe the next year following, so probably 90 or 91. So if Maniac Mansion came out in 87, I guess it would make sense. So I was probably about eight or nine when I played it, or at least when I first tried to play it. But um, so, yeah, it was shared to me. It was a shared game to me when I was young and did not understand the ethics of sharing games. Um, but what was not <laughs> shared to me was the manual that had the um, the access codes to the big security door. So I could only really play like a fraction of the game before blowing up the ma- the mansion. So... For the longest time, a lot of it was me just sort of like playing what's basically a demo and really wanting to play the rest of the game. And, you know, seeing it come out on Nintendo, which I didn't have, seeing it come out in like basically everything. I, I can't remember what the first format it came out with was, uh, if it was Commodore or Amiga or a PC. I'm thinking maybe Commodore, but I had a PC at the time. I'm almost certain it was Commodore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could be wrong, but I think it was the C64, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that makes that makes sense. But uh, at any rate, I had I only had a PC, so I had no other means of playing it except for this copy that I could not do anything without blowing up the mansion. <laughs> but I mean, of that small portion of the beginning of the game, I I played the hell out of it. I I tried to do everything to try to actually see if I could get past that security door of <laughs> copy protection, and I I read up on all these like little things you can do, and I tried to. Um, you know, I tried various different ways to sort of like get around it, uh, wait till characters would walk through the door and try to sneak past them, but that didn't work. But yeah, so I, I guess a lot of my fondness was just this anticipation of wanting to play it while also sort of getting to play a little bit of it and seeing how awesome it was. 
and it was really innovative at the time that you get to choose which characters uh, you're going to bring with you. And each one has a specialty and each one, or well, not Jeff. I think he sucks. Was it Jeff the surfer? <laughs> not you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them was useless. I think it was him. <laughs> I, no, I, yeah, I, I know who it was. He's a surfer guy. I just forget what his name is. I think it was Jeff, but he was useless. So it's, which is also kind of funny when you think about it now in hindsight, uh, because you'd wonder exactly what the purpose of a character who was useless would be. And you think about it now, it's sort of like, well, you know, he's kind of the hard mode. Cause, exactly. Yeah, yeah cause he's, he, because he's useless. Usually you can have a couple characters, and depending on each character, each one has a path to an end game, a victory end game. But if you have, you know, each each one has that path, but together you can come up with multiple solutions to any individual puzzle. Whereas if you bring Jeff, who's useless, you know, Fucking you have Jeff. to rely on like the one path and not screwing that up. And, it, you know, to be honest, or sorry, not, not even honest, but like the way it's set up is that if you only have one path to the end game and you do something wrong, you could actually screw up your chances of winning. Right, exactly. Yeah, and from my memory serves me correctly, it's it's you could almost pick whoever you wanted as long as you had Bernard. He he was really crucial uh, to being able to solve that game. Well, uh, crucial if you picked a a, a less talented character. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I'm trying to be nice to fake <laughs> pixelated people. Um, <laughs> um, but well, yeah, Bernard Bernard was kind of easy mode. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he was um he was easy mode. Uh, not using Bernard was kind of medium, and then using Jeff was hard. Yeah, no, exactly. And and t to your uh, point uh, a moment ago, it was a really breakthrough game because, from what I understand, it was the first adventure game that you could play as different characters. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a selection, a, a you know, a group of characters, and choose different ones, um, which was really cool for, for a few reasons. Um, and I think that the foremost reason is that you could uh, therefore get different endings to the game. That's right. And therefore you can have great replayability because then you can go back and play it on Jeff mode, um, <laughs> make, it, make it hard on yourself. And, you know. um, but it was, it was really cool is that, you know, you could play with different characters. You had to work with them in tandem, um, you know, exploit the... Um, advantages and whatever and and then you know furthermore you get different endings and more re mm. replayability there's actually even one ending that i didn't realize existed until like earlier today when i was trying to refresh my memory on all the different possible endings and one of them is if you play as uh if you play as wendy and you get the meteor's manuscript published and he becomes a famous writer and when you do that the end game is he gets to appear on a talk show and he credits you as uh being why he made it big it turns out that if you actually i don't know if you need bernard for this or you probably need bernard for this so if you play bernard and wendy and you have bernard call the uh meteor police and then you uh finish the game with uh through the wendy route the old the uh then while the meteor is on the talk show, the meteor police will interrupt and come over and arrest him anyways. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I know what I'm doing tonight. So they, they think about these little things, yeah. No, it's really cool. Yeah, you know, another another cool thing um, about this game that I really liked is that, that there's so many different versions of it that it makes it fascinating. Like, the, the C64 graphics are different than that of the version 1 PC graphics, mm -hmm. um, which we could say is, you know, the original. Um, and then there's the version 2 PC release, which was, the I think they called it Deluxe. Maniac mentioned Deluxe, I believe. I think Deluxe was the fan remaster. The, yeah, I got I got crossed up. That's my that's my yeah. mistake. So, so it was the, uh, the version one was original, and then version two would have been uh, enhanced. Yes, that's right. It's the enhanced version, and and you know, to those who don't have a visual, or haven't played both, or played one or the other, it's kind of like roughly comparing in Sierra terminology to like AGI and SCI. That's you right. You know, was was original was was kind of AGI, uh, enhanced was kind of SCI, and then the the fan made game uh, from AGS. Uh, 
the uh, deluxe is uh, I, I would say that's almost like the FM Towns version. You know, it's just got <laughs> all the bells and whistles, just be, you know, gorgeous backgrounds. Um, just took it up that what, one extra notch. Um, and then, of course, there's the uh, NES version, which was really cool. One of the, the very few games uh, or, or beloved adventure classics to get ported to NES besides, uh, what, King's Quest. Mm-hmm. Uh, was it King's Quest 5? King's one Quest of 5 went to-, went to NES. And then the King's Quest 1 went to Sega or something. I, I don't remember King's Quest 1 being released on console. I'm pretty sure it probably did, but I just don't remember it. Yeah, I think uh, I think it was one, and it went to Sega. But, but mm-hmm. less I digress. But it is um, also kind of weird because, like, in the timeline in my head, it, it's weird to match up King's Quest Five as NES era. Yeah, it, yeah, it's really strange. It was definitely a, a kind of a, a regression in graphics because mm-hmm. you know by the time we got to five, you know, it was looking pretty pretty SCI, looked pretty sharp, and and the NES version obviously. Definitely looks way more AGI, you know, a lot more blocky and whatever. Um, I, I, I've got the game. I played it for like five minutes. I, I kind of didn't really feel the need to go through it. I, I think adventure games with a, a controller is a bit clunky. Like, it's nothing more mm-hmm. frustrating than moving an arrow around the screen with a joystick. I hate it. Um, but, but nonetheless, I think it's really cool they did that. And people online seem to be fascinated by it because I... Uh, bef- before this episode uh, in an effort to do research which didn't go well um i had a hot pocket and a microwave and you know it got complicated but i tried for a minute to do research and and when you google maniac mansion on uh, uh <laughs> when you google it on youtube whatever i guess <laughs> <laughs> i guess go- that's correct the, the word Google has, has become has replaced the word search in my brain. I guess <laughs> when you when you search uh, Maniac Mansion on, on uh, YouTube, you'll pretty much get almost nothing but NES reviews. Like maybe in the last few years, people discovered it and got fascinated by it. There's a, there's a shitload of reviews on on YouTube for the NES one. So if you want to check that out, just get a well, visual. I'll tell you something. Um, Maniac Mansion is probably the best adventure game to to port over to NES because. Maniac Mansion was designed to be controlled with the uh key, with the arrow keys on the keyboard. Right, right. So it was basically designed to not have a mouse. So there wasn't really a whole lot to transition other than, you know, obviously they had to redesign it for the graphics and uh, you know, this, the different capabilities between a, a computer, whichever computer it is they played on and a console. But, you know, otherwise it it was um it's not like a lot of other Sierra games where you know, you really need that responsiveness of a mouse to uh, get you from here to there as fast as your hand can move you. This was the sort of, even though you can die, even though there's a lot of ways to screw yourself over, it's never really been based on, oh, you got to do this within the next couple of seconds. Usually when you die, it's because you kind of deserve it. To be perfectly right. honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you kind of a lot. Of, that's kind of also the fun thing. A lot of the deaths are kind of Easter eggs, in that you kind of had to go out of your way to discover how. You know, if if it's not something that blew up the mansion, because that was the sort of something that would, uh, if if you didn't think properly enough, then that would happen. But even then, those would give you like a few seconds to realize what's going on and figure a way around it. Whereas killing the kids individually, kind of required a little bit of extra effort. Like you had to. You had to drain the swimming pool, send a kid down there, and then refill the swimming pool with the kid still down there. You had to know that's going to kill him. Or at least you had right. to know something bad was going to happen. One of the elephants in the room uh, when we're talking about Maniac Mansion is that um, quite a few versions of this has the ability, depending which characters you choose, to put a hamster in a microwave and explode <laughs> it. And then you can give it back to the guy who owns the hamster, Weird Ed, and then he will kill you. Which you kind of deserve if you're going to do that, right? Right? Yeah. It should probably also be put on like a watch list or something. Yeah. Not that I really support that, but in those cases, yeah, that's like you know, for, first you put a hamster in a, in a microwave in a video game, and next thing you know, there's neighborhood cats in your freezer. So yeah, watch yeah. out for them lot. Um, not that we probably all didn't <laughs> do it once we found out we could. So number um, one, you had to kind of find which characters were able to do that. So there's a really good chance that depending who you were playing as, you wouldn't have been able to do it at all. And you probably wouldn't have tried again. Or if you got the right characters and you used the exact right characters in which to attempt this, and then you decided, okay, you know, and it's something I would do. I would definitely try to see if they thought of this and if they would actually allow me to do it. And then I would see, oh, I blew up a hamster. 
And I would probably, if I didn't know any better, I'd probably be like, okay, that's probably not what I was supposed to do, so I'll reload my game. So no, you can't just do that. You would have to say, hey, I'm going to double down and just like go with this, pick up the dead hamster, find his owner, and give it back to him, and see what happens. And then you die. Somebody in LucasArts had a bad experience with hamsters, because <laughs> even in Day of the Technical, aka sort of Maniac Mansion 2, you, know, yeah. you, you, don't, you don't kill it, but you do put it in a deep freeze for like 500 years. So, <laughs> so they de definitely had somebody got bit in like the knob or whatever by a hamster. They had some bad experiences. <laughs> Um, and I'm sorry, I have to say, but there's a really fun Easter egg in, in Thimbleweed Park regarding it. There's a hamster in uh, in uh, Ransom the Clown's trailer. And, you know, Ransom's a well-rotten cat or whatever. And, uh, and you can try and get Ransom to put in the microwave. And even Ransom, who's just a rotten, horrible person, basically, is like, you know, what kind of sick bleep you got to be to put a hamster in a microwave? <laughs> <laughs> Which was a lot of fun. But, but yeah, and uh, I think to your point, it's when you say you kind of have to try to die or, or if you die, you deserve it. It's kind of like saying... You know, unlike the, the brutality of some of the Sierra games, it's like you didn't just like hit the wrong arrow key and fell off a staircase. Like mm -hmm. it's not like super unfair. Like oh my god, I was just trying to go up or down these stairs, mate. It, it's <laughs> it's more like you know you kind of maybe not went out of your way, but like you know, no Sedna chases you in, in the kitchen and you chose not to run for whatever reason. Yeah. Like you know, you really got to make an effort to die for the most part. And that doesn't even kill you. She'll just throw you into the dungeon, which is escapable. That's right. That's right. Good point. And that scene well scared me too. Uh, <laughs> even when I replayed it, something so just jumpy and creepy about it, you know, ice blue skin and just, just the right amount of 8-bit music just scared the shit out of me, even to this day. One of those little facts that's uh, kind of obligatory to mention anytime talking about Maniac Mansion is that the first batch of NES carts uh, that was released, you were able to kill the hamster. Uh, but once it was discovered, they, uh, they had to take that feature out. So depending which... Uh copy you have you might or might not be able to kill that hamster oh now i'm gonna have to put mine in and try it tonight to see which one i got yeah Fuck. why'd you do that to me mate i got work <laughs> to do later damn it well killing a hamster if i can come second to work any day but um so i uh, uh, you know some of the mentionable things i thought was was kind of fun about this game is just little silly things was um uh so ron gilbert kind of I wouldn't say pioneered it because one never really knows, but but he was very vocal. That's probably the right uh, nomenclature for it. Uh, I don't know if I use that word right or not. I just wanted to say. I think, think he's close, anyways. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. Look at me. Uh, drop out using three <laughs> sil syllable words. Um, anyway. Uh, actually, wait. Nomenclature is four syllables. <laughs> well, I, I, did, I did say drop out before that, so. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not not misleading anyone. No false modesty here. Um, <laughs> um, so Ron Gilbert was really, really vocal uh, uh, about, about his uh, puzzle dependency charts, as he calls them. Mm -hmm. um, another thing you can check out, and I, I did in the interim check it out and it is grumpygamer.com um so you can go there and, and, and check out the the why adventure games suck but also check out his um little tab or, or blog or write up whatever on puzzle dependency charts because it's it's well helpful for developers and really cool for just players in general to have kind of an insight onto how adventure games are made um I think it's pretty universal, but it damn sure works for, for all the LucasArts games. Um, and these charts, you know, basically are, are a nice visual way for the creators to, to plan out, you know, if a player does this, you know, it, it can lead to this or that. If he chooses this, and you know, then blah, blah, blah. I'm not right. describing this well at all. It's a visual thing. Well, it's like thing. a flowchart. Thank you. Yes, okay. yes. That's some high school graduate shit right there. Thank you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um one one fun little sort of easter egg and i'm not sure if it's in all versions or not i think it is but if you go to uh weird ed's bedroom the puzzle dependency chart for the game is actually hanging up on the wall in there oh and obviously it's extremely low resolution so you yeah. know I'm, I'm i doubt it's well, extremely i, I, I accurate, think i know but... exactly what you're talking about i just didn't realize that what's what it was yeah yeah I, I didn't the first few times i played it either i had no idea but but yeah i watched a, a cool little youtube on Rog ron gilbert giving a, a postmortem on maniac mansion and he mentioned that um and a few other fun little tidbits none of which i remember 
except for, I don't know why I remember this one, but Razor was based off of Gary Winnick's girlfriend at the time, whose name was Ray. It's, oh. not, even, it's not even that fun, but I, those are the two <laughs> I remember. Um. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I don't know, it was, uh, especially the impact of the time it came out, I'm not sure if I... Especially out of the games that I've played, I don't think there were games I've played up until then that really, as far as adventure games go, that really had multiple solutions. Right. Uh, you know, a lot of them were, I mean, they were to some degree. I mean, I, I think even King's Quest 1 had certain puzzles that had multiple solutions, but never quite to the extent where choosing which characters you play could quite, quite largely uh, impact the game. It's a fairly significantly different game. I wouldn't say completely, but it's a fairly significantly different game if you're playing it, say, as Bernard and doing, like, a Bernard path. Or if you have Wendy on your team and decide to do the Wendy path. Or the musicians, or the photographer, or um, uh, if you if you want Jeff on your team. but uh, Fucking Jeff. <laughs> he, was, he was the original Keith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although he actually could do stuff. He, he yeah, was, uh, yeah. yeah. He didn't just take smoke breaks mm-hmm. yeah, in his defense. He, he was a good. Um, I actually saw a speed run where they used Jeff, and he was good for just being like the kind of decoy that they need to just sort of uh, fast teleport to the dungeon by getting him caught. That's all I thought of when you said it in the very beginning of the episode. I'm like, I thought of that exact moment. I'm like, well, you could send him to the door for the package and send him <laughs> as the decoy. So, yeah, there we go. It'll work. That's basically all he is. He's a decoy. So, yeah, I mean, it would be incorrect, I suppose, to say that it was the first game that had multiple solutions to puzzles. But it was, a, it, it was like you said, uh, about the replayability. Like It was kind of a different game, depending on who you used. And, you know, they kind of, LucasArts kind of did this a little bit later on, too, with like something like Fate of Atlantis, where you could choose, like, three fairly different games, depending on if you want, like, um, a solo team or action uh, paths. And just, I don't know, it's really kind of cool, especially for the time, because it's sort of like, you know, you've never seen anything quite like that, where it's just sort of like, hey, choose which characters you want. And uh, I, I don't remember if they give you sort of like a description of the character at the character select screen. They do, right? They they, they give you a description of more like, it's more of like a personality description. You mm-hmm. know, they, they don't really allude to how helpful or not they'll be, though. You oh, know, no, 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 of more... course not. But they, they'll tell you basically what they're about. Yeah, like, you know, this guy's in the new wave music and he's totally rad right. or whatever would work for the, the time. But yeah, yeah, it was it just personality based. Definitely didn't give you a heads up, like, nod, nod, you should pick him or you shouldn't pick no, him. No, or, of course. Or the shit at this or that, um, which, which you know, m- maybe would have been nice, but I'm kind of glad they didn't. Yeah. But but like you said, it, it's not even about, you know, a different way around the puzzles. Like you said, it's it kind of gives you a whole different game in a sense or, or a way around the game, a different mm-hmm. story. Um, the way it plays out, hence different endings, different characters. It was well, well ahead of its time, for sure. We did bring up a really good point about how they, you know, they kind of give you a peek into the character personalities, but they don't actually, like, allude to the fact that, hey, you know what, Bernard is actually, like, the most useful guy, or Jeff is completely useless. You, there's, you really don't know which mode you're getting. You could have, um, you know, let's say Bernard and Wendy, which is, like, kind of like a powerhouse team that you can, like, do anything and win versus if you have Jeff and um I don't know anyone else you, you don't know that Jeff is useless Jeff is just sort of this guy and he's you know when you when you play the game for the first time you don't know who's better than other people it's very possible that you're like hey this guy seems like a pretty cool dude and you don't realize that he's he is hard mode <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and and it's it's funny too because I, I wouldn't ask them to to like Obviously, they'd be a little more subtle, but like Bernard's the best, and so and so sucks, and thing. But but I would kind of it wouldn't be out of the realm of asking to be like Bernard's skill set includes, and right. you know Razor's skill set includes. Like that would be a nice subtle way of just letting you know what they excel at, and then you know if he got to Jeff and it was like, yeah, Jeff's a fun guy to party with, but he makes a <laughs> shitty roommate. Um, <laughs> the- <laughs> Well, I mean, they do kind of they they say that Bernard is like a, a science guy, I guess. Um, they do they say that you know, they they talk about how uh, Sid and Razor are you know they're musicians. They 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 do point out that they have like a band and stuff like that. 
Right, right. But, but, and it's funny, because as you say that, really, Bernard's the only one through the explanation that gives any sort of clue that they might help, because you don't feel like going into a mansion to rescue somebody, you'd need a musician um, or, like, you know, a, a, a punk rocker, like Razor or whatever. But but you read one of them's a scientist. You're like, yeah, I probably need that guy. Um, but, yeah, the rest of them is just like, yeah, this guy's a real chill dude. Like, uh, uh, all right, I guess, you know, he'll relax the team, keep everyone calm. I don't know. Um, but, yeah. You know, actually, if anything, it's kind of funny because um, if anything, the, the character select screen probably tries to discourage you from playing as bernard because number one they make him look really nerdy at a time when nerds aren't particularly cool right right so they make it very obvious you know even his character's description he's um i don't know if they call him a nerd but he's very nerd and he's the only one in the character selection if you choose him his facial expression changes oh, he's, really? the, he's the only one that does this so everyone else it just puts a little box around them to show that you've selected them right when you do it to bernard when you do it to Bernard, he gives a look on his face like he was not expecting you to choose him, and now he's scared. Oh, poor guy's got low self-esteem. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so he totally but... doesn't want you to choose him. And in fact, in the beginning, well, when you start the game, and um, Dave is sort of like, okay, if there's anyone who doesn't want to go through with this, Bernard tries to run away. That's right, yeah. Hmm, that's interesting because, you know, even though the facial expression could be like, oh, maybe I mucked up by choosing him, if if you were to really overthink it and, and come to the conclusion like no one else's facial expression changed, like, that could be a little clue, like, you know, he's the special one because he's done something different than the rest. That's interesting. I wonder what the intention but, was there. Yeah, but the thing is, based on what you would imagine, based on what you would assume, <laughs> that right. kind of, his his facial expression kind of suggests that he's not a good one to choose. Yeah, he, do, he, yes, he doesn't inspire <laughs> confidence at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and yet he's the, he's the best one. So, so much so that he's the only returning of, of the playable characters. He's the only one who returns in Day of the Tentacle, or at least as yeah. a playable character. Um, and, you know, now, now that you mentioned Day of the Tentacle, and, and not to get off topic at all, I'll make this really short, but one thing I, I thought was... Just to get your thoughts on this, um, I, I've never had a particular issue with this, but today, just just looking back at it, because my my four year old really likes Day of the Tentacle. Um, a lot of that is me forcing it down his throat, like, "Hey, here's a bunch of educational games, and then if you want to play a fun game, it's this one." <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no no minions or, or, or gumball or whatever, none of that. You're gonna you're gonna play this, but anyway, uh, so he right likes that game, so I've been through the first five minutes of it like four hundred times and um so you know got in the layout of the house w what i found it just a little bit odd i, I won't say disappointing because i don't mean it so that's the reason not to say it anyway what i find odd and what i want to get your thoughts on is why the mansion changed so much because i felt like the original mansion would have would have pretty much worked in day of the technical the way it was like the, the vault room the the basement the pool that there was a lot to work with in other words it was a really large environment um and then with day of the technical which was meant to be mm, somewhere between a sequel and a spiritual successor uh, i guess you could say a sequel i mean it does start off the game the monologue saying i never thought i'd go back to the mansion um why they changed it from like this creepy sort of mansion to a hotel I mean, I guess the easiest answer to describe in character would probably just be um, they renovated. <laughs> uh, but in terms of like, I guess there's just the practicality of like, you know, they had an idea for a game. They kind of, you know, the, the art direction is very different between the first and second game uh, entirely um, in general. And I guess they just sort of like wanted to make the, the mansion suit the game that they wanted to make as opposed to, you know, cling to the way it was and try to make the game revolve around that. I, right. I, I don't really know. I can't put it ma uh, words in anyone's mouths. I'm just assuming that it was just sort of like, they just didn't sweat it basically. They're just like, okay, well yeah. who cares? So we'll just do it our way and we'll make a good game nonetheless. And if we make a great game, then no one will particularly care except obviously nerds do. We do. We think about this sort of stuff. You know what? We just got to ignore that. And just, just in order to enjoy the game. <laughs> yeah exactly but but in the end you're right i mean at the end of the day i love it every, you know it's universally admired game for the most part you know it's, everyone loves stay the technical but basically so it, they pretty much succeed in what you're saying where it's like they made a great game so you know it didn't didn't really matter we are uh 
we are chugging along here. So are there any final thoughts you might have on Maniac Mansion and how awesome it is and why it's your favorite game of all time? Um, I, I will say it's got to be up there for the introduction of the Scum Engine. I absolutely love it. I love, as we've already discussed, that how you can combine different players, get different endings. I think that's absolutely mint. One thing I didn't mention that was kind of cool, um, and that this, this you're just kind of walking in line, so be good out there when I tell you this information. If you own the NES cartridge, you have to own it. Don't be, don't be a prick, all right? Don't that be a sense. tuna head. Yeah, that was so much better. Yes. Really showed me up back there. Well done. <laughs> um, if you own the NES cartridge and have the, the capability of getting the uh, bio off of it, um, then there's um, f- uh, uh, fan-made hacks for the NES version. Um, there's two of them that I know of. Um, one of them is, is like a zombie take on it, which is really kind of cool. And all it does, it, it changes the story just a little bit, but mostly changes the graphics. Um, anything zombies, you know, kind kind of neat to an extent, you know. It was oversaturated a few years ago. Now, now I feel like I can breathe, and it's becoming cooler again. <laughs> I can let I can a let it back bit, yeah. into my life a little bit. Yeah, maybe a little too soon, but but nonetheless. Um, so again, if you own the NES cartridge, um, this this mate named Rilo something, you have to go on your own from there. Um, made two hacks for it. One's named after himself, and the other's called uh, Zombie something. Um, again, just you know, Google it if you own the cartridge. But it's pretty cool because you know it's just a, a slightly fresh take on a game we all love. With uh, the writing is just a little bit different. Obviously, a little more cutting edge, a little more naughty, modern, whatever. So that's kind of a neat thing to do if you own the uh, NES version. Mm-hmm. So that's that's pretty much the only other thing i wanted to say on it um what what about you well in closing um be honest with me is it your favorite game of all time it's like yes it is 